right, so it looks like it's recording. So hi, I'm Andrew Miller. I'm section editor for Respiratory Care. We're here with an interview with the authors with Eduardo and Rob from the Cleveland Clinic. And I'll give you guys a quick chance to introduce yourselves. We'll start with Eduardo. Uh, hi, Andrew. My, uh, my current role, uh, I'm serving as the director of the medical intensive care unit uh, at the main campus in Cleveland Clinic. I also serve as the director for the Simulation and Advanced Skills Center for the Cleveland Clinic and I'm vice chair of the Department of Critical Care Medicine. Uh, those are my roles. And Rob? Yeah, I'm uh, the Enterprise Program Manager for Respiratory Care Research. I'm also a professor in the Department of Medicine and the director of the Simulation Fellowship at the Simulation Center. Nice. Now I'm going to pull up the paper we're going to be talking about here. Share my screen. Um, this is a paper on the impl implementing protocolized care in ARDS by Doug. Did I pronounce his name right? And the rest yeah, of the I mean, team yeah. from the, the Cleveland Clinic. And so my first question is, what prompted you guys to do the study? That's always the big, the big question. So why did you decide to do this study? Um, the the main one was that. Uh, we wanted to see if all the efforts that we had uh, gotten involved in to improve our care had yielded any, any results at the level of patients. Uh, so it was a, an effort to recognize first if what we thought that was happening was happening and uh, if there was any positive outcomes on, on the patients or not. Uh, as you know, sometimes the inter implement, uh, implementation yields badness instead of goodness. Yeah, I agree. I think implementation science is really important. It's kind of a, sometimes we're not always doing what we think we're doing, which is a big challenge that we see a lot of times when we do similar projects. And uh, when you brought the group together, how many, how many, so one of the things I think about is when RTs want to develop similar protocols, you know, when you put your initial team together, you know, how many meetings did you have? And you know who was all involved and how long did it take to get people to kind of agree, you know agree on what what should be in the, the protocol yeah that's a, a fantastic question because uh, it was a new thing for me actually when when we started that um duncan uh height uh at that time charged us with uh trying to generate a protocol for ards that uh, was uh, aligned with the the present times back then and so uh, what, we, what we did was we grabbed all the, the people that were interested, the people that had uh, expertise on the area, uh, and those that make things happen. So it was uh, at that time, as you may recall, we did not use Zoom or <laughs> meetings of any virtual uh, type. So we would get everybody on, on a on on a room and that included uh, the initial main hit was uh, physicians and respiratory therapists. It was all of us in a, in a group and uh, there was a, it, there were several meetings. The first one obviously is the organization, but then um, a lot of work that we did was related to uh, what we were actually doing. And so uh, I'll tell you just an anecdote, for example, in which Rob uh, and myself uh, went at different times of the day, uh, even the night and very early in the morning. And we would stand in front of all the patients that were intubated and we would record their size, what mode they were, what was the tidal volume, what was the PEEP. And that was uh, actually a very important thing that we did because it highlighted a lot of uh, activities that we were not doing, that we thought that we were doing well but we actually were not. And so we presented that data to the group. And that actually, when, when they show you how you're behaving it, it, and you think that you're doing really well, you can imagine that that burns a little bit. So that generates impetus for change. Yeah, that's really amazing. So um, I'm gonna pull the paper, I get, I'm gonna pull the paper back up here real quick and then. Yep. I just want to kind of talk about the results because the, the results are pretty impressive in terms of, you know, benefits to the patients, right? Which is what we, what we care about. And you can scroll through. There's a lot of amazing graphs in this, in this one. Yeah. And I really want to, 
and lots of the other variables improved too, right? So driving pressure, plateau pressures, all those things were much better. But I think this is what um, I'd like to ask you guys about is that, did you guys expect to find this big of an impact in mortality when you, when you did this study? Well, I'll, 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 Rob, uh, I'll ask you, what, what did you feel when you see, saw these changes? I was impressed. Um, it, was, uh, it was really interesting that there was such a, a big effect on mortality, but not so much on the length of stay or duration of mechanical ventilation. And that, I, I've seen that in other studies, and I'm not sure why that happens. Maybe you could comment. Yeah. This was a, a, a true, true uh, interesting part. I will tell you, um, Andrew, as you, as you can imagine, like any study, you start going, uh, we saw first the raw data, and then you start saying, well, are we, what we're seeing is that the, the truth, how do we make this more robust? How do we um, go through the, the process? And is there evidence that the results that we're seeing uh, are a manifestation of what we changed? Uh, as, as you can uh, imagine, there's uh, other factors that changed during that period of time that could have influenced this. And we tried to adjust for all these uh, changes by doing the propensity matching and adjusting and more adjusting to, to, to be sure that we put all the factors that were there, the Apache three score, Charlson and, and whatnot. The, the, the most important part for us was that we could see a shift in the in the behaviors of the team uh, in the supplemental appendix there's a very nice graph of our tidal volumes uh, that to me were very telling how we had several patients that were uh, at very high tidal volumes and it was not a small proportion there was a good amount of proportion of patients with very large tidal volumes uh, that were not only on the very severe ARDS, but on the regular uh, or the less severe uh, ARDS. And, and those are things that we needed to change on our rehearing. And we saw that shift towards the towards a more long protective ventilation uh, that that matches what we're seeing over here. Uh, I, I, the, and similarly, there were movements in the same direction for the plateau pressure, for the PEEP, uh, for the use of rescue strategies. And all, all of those are, are, uh, are following that uh, thought of, well, we're following now a protocol. There's better education on the teams. They're applying it better. And that is uh, leading to changes on the outcomes of these patients. And uh, the story made more sense to us under those circumstances. Yeah, and I think table five talks about uh, deviations from standards. Mm -hmm. Which one? I can't remember which table that is, but. Uh, oh, this one is that I, have, that I have pulled up right now is table five. Okay, it might have been table two or three. It was one of the outcomes that it was talking about in terms of deviations from, from the standard. There, I think that one's. Yeah, it's table there two. There we go. Peep, peep discrepancies and tidal volume discrepancies. So that that sort of tells the story, about um, you know specifically you know in the area of the tidal volumes. Um, less variation uh, from the uh, the standard range, which I think was from four to eight. Yeah, I think that's that's really impressive results, especially for plateau pressure going from forty seven percent to seventy seven percent. That's mm -hmm. a pretty big impact, and then obviously a lot fewer patients with tidal volume greater than ten. So that that's really cool work. And one thing that I'm very curious about as an RT is the the educational rollout of this protocol, right? So it's a big challenge just to kind of get everybody even in the same room. So did you guys have any trouble with buy-in from any, you know, physicians or RTs or was everybody on board right away? Uh, there's we had a bit never... of a problem at the beginning. I wouldn't call it a problem. It was just trying to get consensus around what, what ventilator modes to use, what the modes mean. You know, everybody has their own understanding of, of how these things operate and you know the biases for pressure control versus volume control all those things it took a long time just to get on the same page that we were talking the same language so we put a lot of effort into doing that yeah absolutely i think that the the, the other thing was um is getting out of the posture business uh so this is the mode that i want and and this is why i, I do it under these circumstances so you just open the forum 
to people to voice their discrepancies and and to show the evidence or physiological background to to do that. So. Uh, uh, there, there's different ways to implement change. Uh, there's the change in which you essentially command and control and say, this is gonna be the way that it is. And then you, you let the hammer go down. This was uh, not, not the way it was done. This was more of a collegial environment in which uh, we, we moved through reasoning and, and actually learning from the, the process of implementation. There was a, a lot of things that, that changed. Um, one one of the examples that, that I will give you is the use of rescue uh, uh, therapies. Uh, how the, the the use of rescue therapies changed after we started implementing the the protocol, and that had to do with how do you respond to abnormalities in in the ventilator or physiological, and how do you uh, how do you are you implementing your protocols? Are you titrating your PEEP appropriately so that you can get rid of those abnormalities? Are you uh, protecting the lung uh, better? And are you now uh, putting more steps in front that they should be doing before getting to those rescue strategies that before they were using just rapidly, right? Um, so uh, it was, it, it, th there were challenges all throughout. And actually, I will tell you, they, they continue to exist. Um, I, when I see this, uh, the changes in tidal volume and you see that change of seven point something to some seven point something, you would want it to see a larger delta. But uh, uh, you also have to be honest that reality is really hard to, to establish a very tight tidal volume control without causing other harms around it, right? So uh, we have to balance awake and interactive uh, with synchrony, with balanced work of breathing and lung injury. How do you collate those? And that's not just day one when they come in that everybody can paralyze them and give them very nice tidal volumes. It's throughout their stay. So, yep. Yeah, we started way back in 2012 and we developed a, a self-directed online basic course in mechanical ventilation, which has evolved over all these years into what we call the SAVA program, which is stands for Standardized Education for Ventilatory Systems. We followed that up with um, papers. We did a rational <laughs> a way to, to rationally select modes. We did a taxonomy of modes. We did a taxonomy of patient ventilator interaction. So over the course of many years, we've developed um, a means that we can both train physicians and respiratory therapists and share a common language so that we can, we can discuss these things that Eduardo is mentioning at the bedside. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And uh, when you do, do the, the therapists and the physicians train together or like for the, I think you mentioned simulation studies in here. Did you bring everybody together as a group to kind of get everybody on the same page? I know that can be a challenge for us because sometimes the fellows kind of learn separately and the RTs learn separately. And then sometimes there's headbutting at the bedside about what the best thing to do is. <laughs> uh, that, that's the, that's the key of this, this program is uh, there's, touch points in which we actually have our, our RTs and, and physicians trained together. Um, and more and more actually, because the, the way that this has evolved is that now this is a, moving towards a, a standardized course that all our, uh, all our fellows and physicians take and all our respiratory therapists take. Uh, and there, it has different levels. So it's like a ladder and for some people, they just need the basics, right? And others want to go all the way to what we call the master level. Uh, but it has to be interprofessional and it has to be consistent. It cannot be physicians uh, teaching uh, physicians just the, the part that they want to know. The RTs are dealing with this the same as the, the physician. So the, the, the course uh, has no difference. Uh, if you're a physician, a physician for, uh, assistant or advanced practice provider, a, a medical student or a respiratory therapist, you're going to get the same package because it's what you need to manage the patient. Yeah. Plus, when we do live training at the simulation center, we have developed team-based learning to a pretty high degree. And so we'll have tables of teams and we intentionally mix up the professions so that they're all talking to each other, just like they do at the bedside. And it works out quite well. That, that is awesome. And uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. I just want to thank you guys again for joining me. 
And we'll put some links to the papers that Robin and Eduardo mentioned in the box so you can read those. Um, and again, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for highlighting our paper. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs>